Welcome to the Contractor Success Forum. Today we are talking about the key components of a good construction financial statement that you should have for it you send it to your bond agent. Here on the Contractor Success Forum, our mission is to provide game-changing financial education for contractors to help you be more profitable, grow, and succeed in your business. And who is here to help us? As usual, we have Stephen Brown with McDaniel Whitley Bonding and Insurance Agency. And I'm Wade Carpenter with Carpenter Company CPAs. So, Stephen, this is a topic you suggested. What did you want to discuss on financial statements today? The key components of one. Okay. Here's the thing. A lot of contractors are good at building stuff, but they're not good accountants. I mean, a lot of bond agents, too, are not good accountants. We're not supposed to be accountants. You're supposed to be the expert. And as I was telling you, I've learned m most everything I know about accounting from construction CPAs who've been patient enough to explain things to me. And also, I used to be a bond underwriter, and we were trained in analyzing financial statements. But it's your job to put those key components in for us to study to make a decision on whether to bond you or not. So the very first thing that we were taught is you look at the financial statement that you receive, and these are usually year-end financial statements. It's the cornerstone of the whole next year's worth of your work is your year in financial statement and your ability to get fairly accurate in-house interim statements every quarter that you need your CPA to help you do almost always. So here's the thing. We were taught, get your financial statement. It's a neat stack of papers. Stack it up. There's a cover letter with the name of the CPA firm on. You flip it over and there's a letter that tells you whether it's a compilation, a review, or an audit. And I wanted to ask you to explain those components in a little bit. And then the next item that we would look for is the table of contents, just to mm -hmm. make sure there weren't pages missing. And believe it or not, there are some contractors that have certain pages in their financial statement that they don't want you to know about, and they'll just leave that page out. Well, that's what they taught us to do. Look for the table of contents. Then we start off with balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, then some other type of statements and some notes, and then work in progress showing completed projects done in the prior year and jobs in progress. Work on hand, WIP, jobs in progress. And that's a beautiful construction financial statement to me, Wade. Okay. Well, I mean, you just kind of went down the whole thing, but there, there are definitely some key components I think we should probably talk about. Of those key components, why are they important? What do they tell you as an accountant to help educate your contractor about running their business? And also, I wish you'd take just a second to explain the difference between a compilation or a review and an audit. Okay. Well, I know we did another episode. I don't know what episode number it was, but we explained the differences in the levels. But essentially, there is actually a fourth level now that a lot of people don't even know about, the preparation level. But let's start at the top. The audit level is what everybody thinks about. And essentially, that's a lot of work to basically tie down the numbers and basically ensure that they're not materially misstated. That's all. We're not guaranteeing there's no errors in there, or there's, but what we're trying to do is make sure that there's no major errors in the whole thing. So what do you do with the contractor inventory? I know that's a big deal for audits. Well, if they have inventory, yes. There's a lot of things with contractors. If you're on percentage of completion, you've got a lot of estimates. And inevitably, wherever you estimated a job in the middle of the year or the, at the end of the year, things are going to change. And so it's, it's, again, we're trying to establish that things are not materially different. And there are obviously things that are going to go wrong sometimes on a job. But that's the goal is to say, for the most part, nothing's out of place. A CPA is the only one that can issue an audit. A CPA is the only one that can issue any of these reports, the review the compilation or the preparation. I have seen some bookkeeping firms or non-CPAs put these reports on there, but they don't mean anything. And unfortunately, according to our rules, they ethically can't put that stuff on there. They can't state that they're a CPA. And essentially, we're giving our opinion 
on whether these statements are materially correct. Well, that's what the bonding company is relying on. Someone right. beside them to verify some things. We were always taught that, you know, a review just basically verified cash and a few things. And I know it, it does more. And that we always thought the audit meant every item that was on that statement was verified to some degree of compliance, of which no one understood the rules of the AICPA on, on what those were. And then the compilation was just nothing more than just taking the information off the contractor's computer and prettying it up, but not verifying anything. So compilations were not considered worthy to getting bonds. The review, there are some procedures on there. And then a lot of what we're doing is, yes, we should be looking at every one of them and every account and making sure that they're not materially misstated. It's still the goal. But we're going to do some analytical procedures and say, you know, hey, does this look out of line? We look at ratios and things like that to, to give a little more assurance that things are not out of line. Mm -hmm. The compilation report, as you stated, there are some CPAs that will just slap a compilation and essentially the report really does say we're essentially we're not aware of anything that would make it differ from GAP, but there are some people that just say, yes, we're going to take it and put it on the, on there and just stick this report on there. But the full disclaimer that, that they're not verifying anything. Well, I guess there are different approaches to that. We don't take that approach in here. Well, of course not, but, but I mean, there are a lot of those out there. Yeah. But the fourth level that came in, I think around 2016 or so, was basically one of the problems that CPAs had is we could not put out a financial statement without putting a report on it. So for a bookkeeping firm or somebody else, they didn't have all these extra costs and all these extra rules to stick financial statements out there. So they kind of made this preparation level to where we can go out there and say, we can either write a report or there's actually headers and footers we can put on the statements itself and not put a report. But essentially it's saying we're, again, we're not doing any procedures at all to say it's in accordance with GAAP or it could be in accordance with your income tax basis or whatever. But I mean, in a nutshell, that's the major report differences. And I think we could probably refer some people to that other episode if you want to get in more detail on some of those. Sure. It's important because, okay, key components of a financial statement. But a bonding agent, the key component is that it's a review caliber or better audit financial statement. That's the most important thing to us. It's the main piece of equipment, the tool that we need to do our job for you. But also, more importantly, just from what your bond agent thinks or your banker might think or someone else, what do you think as the owner of the construction company? What kind of information is that statement telling you and how do you use that as a basis for the upcoming year. Right. Well, I mean, I guess I, I would talk about some of the things that I would look for. Okay. Uh, and I do, I do hate to say it, but I, I know bond agents have told me the same thing that you can pick up a financial statement and say, does this guy know what he's doing or not or later? Right. And so if you're number one, if you're a contractor and you're doing longer term contracts, you should be on percentage and completion basis. That's gap. And mm -hmm. so if you look on your balance sheet and you don't see over or under billings or costs in excess of estimated earnings on uncompleted contracts, if you want the, or the billings in excess, you know, that's, that's probably if you're on a cash or, com, you know, right. contract. I mean, that, that doesn't do you any good for bonds, Wade. Right. So that's one of the things I would look for on a balance sheet. I'm just going to hit some high notes, but I, I kind of wanted to spend some time talking about some of the contract schedules and that kind of stuff. Okay. The way we do an income statement is we do a summary financial statement in the front, and then we do some detail schedules. We're breaking down the job cost and the SG&A or the overhead expenses in the back. And what I believe is your cost of revenues on your P&L should be reflecting what's in the, that statement in the back as well as should tie to your completed and incomplete contract 
So the way we work it is we do the main components of the financial statements, the balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement, and then the notes. And then we will actually do a supplementary report. And I've had conversations with my peer reviewer about this, but it is, I mean, and we, if we get into it, I can explain why we do it because sometimes say a contractor needs to turn in like their financial statements to a supplier or an owner or something like that, but they don't want them to see the contracts and how they're coming out on those kind of things. So we have it where we can do a short form and long form, but I guess I'm getting off the topic here, but. No, I mean, I, I want to know when you said my peer reviewer, what did you mean by that? Who well, is it? So as a CPA, if you're issuing any kind of financial statements above the preparation level, we have to get peer reviewed. People come in and look at our work to be sure that we're following our rules. So that can give you and a banker and anybody else using those financial statements assurance that we're doing the job we're supposed to be doing. So that's essentially the reason we do it. Okay. But again, we probably do a little different from a lot of CPA firms and that we put that additional report on there and all the stuff that is behind that with the contract schedules and the, we do things like a retained receivable schedule that bonding companies want to see. Yes. That really are not required parts of the financial statement. And I believe that if you're getting bonded, you need to get some of these things in there. That's right. But, you know, behind this supplemental report is a reconciliation of, number one, the income statement, the contracts, a summary of the contracts from the completed contract schedule and the completed contracts in progress schedule. Right behind that is a completed contract schedule and mm -hmm. contracts in progress schedule. You know, the completed contract should be reporting the costs and the revenues that were earned on those jobs, mm -hmm. as well as I believe something that's not disclosed a lot is the type of job. I mean, you may have some that are fixed price. You may have some that are cost plus or time and materials or whatever, but depending on who's reading that statement and a bond underwriter, I mean, they may look at a job a little differently if they were fixed price type job versus time mm -hmm. and materials. I mean, well, a good bond agent's going to go back to that CPA and have a relationship with that CPA to clarify some things before the questions start coming up from the underwriter. And as always, just us talking today, I've learned things I didn't know before. You know, thank you for that. But when we're talking about the components, balance sheet, which shows your assets and your liabilities, Bonding hmm. companies looking at current assets and subtracting it from current liabilities and getting working capital. That's a key underwriting component to a bonding company. And then hmm. they have their own things that they move above or below the line as the term that right. they take out of your current assets and they don't give you credit for, but current assets or anything liquid in current liabilities or anything that you owe within the next 12 months. Is that right? Well, current assets are assets that could be turned into cash within 12 months, essentially. Okay. That's, okay. that's really the definition. Accounts receivable, cash yeah. value, life insurance. But yeah, I mean, exactly what you're talking about goes into the next statement. The contract statement is the contracts in progress. And that's where we're reporting an over or under billing on a percentage of completion basis. And that right. number should be tying right back to that balance sheet. So if you're underbilled, does that show up as a current asset or a current liability? That's a current asset. Essentially, it says that, hey, we've only billed so much, but we've actually earned so much based on, say, we're actually 50% complete and we've only billed 45% of the job, then that we're going to recognize revenue up to that point. Right. And sometimes it can be the other way around. That's where bonding company wants to be sure that it's not overbilled. We could be front loading all the bills, not paying our costs <laughs> and be completely overbilled. And, you know, that, that's what we're trying to avoid. You're right. Too much overbilling, too much underbilling are going to throw up some red flags. Some of it may be healthy under certain circumstances. Some of them may not be healthy, but their perception of what that is going to depend on whether you get working capital credit for it. So right. that's one thing. And, and then are they reasonable. 
Yes. And then we talked, we were talking about the income statement a while ago and cash flow statements that are in there. What does that tell a contractor, Wade? Well, essentially there's two different types. There's direct and indirect, and I won't get into the differences, but there's two ways we're getting at like what happened to the cash. We started the year with X amount of cash. We ended the year with X amount of cash. So did some of it come from operations or did some of it come from financing loans or, I mean, were we paying down debt? Those kind of things. Right. So essentially that's what it does. The way we do a contractor financial statement, we do the direct and the indirect with facing pages. And essentially the direct and indirect differences are on the operating side of the business. So mm-hmm. for one side is the cash received from contracts and cash paid out to suppliers and employees versus the other way is more like a balance sheet approach. Hey, we started with cash, but receivables went up, cash retainage went up. So our cash went down, payables went up. So, so it's just a two different ways of reconciling what happened to cash. Okay. okay. And it tells you, number one, are, if you're bleeding cash or are you fumbling cash back in or where did the money go? Where did it come from? So, and, and again, that's considered a key component. They're in every good construction CPA year in financial statement. Yeah. Even though we talked about income statement briefly, I probably went a little bit too fast in saying you look at sales, then it shows your gross profit, and then it shows your net income or net lost. Right. So, well, you've heard this before, Wade, but in my business, we've got this five minute underwriting. First of all, is this a CPA that's good and that we trust them, that the bonding companies trust? They have a good reputation. Number two, what degree is this statement prepared? Number three, what's the working capital? Number four, did they make money or lose money? And if they made a little bit of profit or a little bit of break even, then you look to see if there's any backlog gross profit in there. And you look at the billings, over and under billings. But that's mm-hmm. five minute underwriting that we do it's scary isn't it but i mean it's just it's the driving it's the driving force well you're jumping into several things i wanted to dive into we had gotten to the completed contract schedule and i wanted to spend a few minutes on the incomplete because that is again where we're basically saying are we over or under build um and the other part what you were talking about we're talking about what's applied to job cost Gap specifies what's supposed to be going into job costs, but I don't want to name any names because I worked at a very large Atlanta firm that still, you know, on several of their contractors, they would do just direct costs only, direct labor materials. And there are several things that can be affected in that. But again, sticking with that in progress schedule, it tells you a lot of different things and it should be telling you some things like on an in progress schedule, it should tell you estimated completion dates. It should also be telling you things like, is there stored materials on this job? Because it should be affecting your over and under billings calculation. And a lot of firms do that wrong. They adjust it in their over under billings when it's actually a component of cost. And I won't get into that right now. No, but that's- um, there's also an issue with gap says, if you got a job in progress and we think we're going to have a loss, we need to recognize that immediately. So we need to make adjustments on that schedule to go ahead and recognize the estimated loss as of that date. Mm-hmm. So if we've lost on a percentage of completion basis, you know, $50,000 and we expect it to be $75,000 total loss, we're going to recognize another 25,000. Okay. Again, on that contracts in progress schedule, is also one of the components of we're looking at backlog. And so we're looking at the way a gap statement looks at backlog is we're total contracts in progress minus the revenues. I know a lot of bonding companies look at it like total contracts minus build to date, right? Because that's yeah. what's burned off, right? That's right. But One of the other things that we glossed over in the notes is that's something else that should also be reflected in the notes to the financial statement. Okay. The notes should be reflecting, here's where our backlog is and a reconciliation of that, but they should also be noting 
that we should have, say the statement is done in March or something like that. Any contracts that are signed up to that date, they should also be footnoted in the notes to it. So people like Stephen, you, you know, when you go to analyze these financial statements, you're looking for a lot of things for backlog too. I mean, tell us how you use some of that stuff. Well, you can't, and I've told you this before, but you can't have enough notes in your statement to make a bond underwriter happy because remember everything you're commenting on is verifying something that you've been told or that you've observed. So having an extra set of eyes observing the same thing with a reputable construction CPA carries a lot of weight. And when we were talking about notes, that is a nice thing on your statement and how you analyze and represent the backlog. And the bonding companies look for your backlog of gross profit. So in other words, bonding companies can tell whether you historically make money. Or if you lose money on a certain job, they want to know why. Usually there's some good reasons for it. And the old running joke is uh, bond agents would say, just tell them it's the weather. They can't <laughs> talk about that unless they have a farmer's albinac. I mean, seriously, there's a reason you lost money and bonding companies need to know what it is. And for one thing is they want to know if you're robbing Peter to pay Paul on projects too. Exactly. So, so an even amount of profit, consistent amount of profit gives bonding companies a great deal of comfort. I mean, wouldn't you be, if you were underwriting a contractor and you saw that track record. And yeah. so the notes that you put in Wade are so powerful because the notes, first of all, say, all right, this is how their accounting system is set up. This is how their taxes are paid. They are a subchapter S corporation. All right, that's one of the first notes that's comforting. Okay, got that, got that, because we don't always know. And then the next thing that you get into is equipment notes payable. How much right. is current liability? How much is long term? You break that out and gives underwriters an idea. Okay, that's normal for that type of construction company, that amount of overhead expense. And then the other notes that have to do with receivables and payables, credit exposure. What are some other notes? Well, in, like I said, we could spend a whole podcast talking about the notes, talking about the receivables and payables. We typically will put a schedule in the back of the financial statements that details like the retainage, as we said before. But I wanted to come back to one thing you just said. We, bonding companies and everybody wants to know, are, are you able to estimate your projects accurately? And yeah. again, things will come up. And sometimes the job will go wrong. Hopefully, sometimes the job will come in a little better. But one of the notes that actually GAP says should be in there, and I don't see it a lot on other CPAs' financial statement, but there should be a reconciliation or a footnote in there that says, hey, these jobs that were in progress at the end of last year, they actually came in this way. So it increased or it decreased our profitability for this year because of the estimates that weren't exactly right last year, if that made any sense. Yeah. So yeah, you got to make adjustments for that. And also, I imagine when you take over, doing a year in for an account that wasn't posted correctly the year before, that can be a mess. But also the notes that, that talk about loans to or from shareholders. Oh yeah. And there's several of those. If you have that as account current asset, uh, loans from shareholder that's thrown right off from the bonding company, because it's usually you and they're underwriting the company, not you, unfortunately, a lot of the times. There are several things like if you've got a lawsuit or something going on or contingencies on, those are the things that should be footnoted in there. One of the things that a lot of times for a, say a heavy equipment contractor that mm -hmm. a lot of their stuff is on, a lot of their equity is in the heavy yellow iron, whatever, you know, the fixed assets. We'll do a lot more detail, not a complete detail of it, but you know, like this is the major components or fixed assets and how depreciated those are. So, I mean, we think a lot of people appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, and I wanted to kind of address one thing that I know you asked me on a, one of our mutual clients recently about, or you commented on the way we did our financial statement or contract schedules. 
we put like a contract number and we don't put the name. And the very last one of these statements is the contract number codes and a description of the job. And the reason we do that is because a lot of times these contractors end up, if they're heavy water sewer or whatever, they turn in these county bids and some of them become public record and they don't want the competition or, you know, that they're getting X amount on doing a certain type of work. So they can choose to leave that off when they send it to the, say a city or county or those kind of things. That's the reason we did that. And I know you mentioned it, but. I wanted to address that. We did another one for the bonding company with the project names in there so we could match it up. Yeah, we would definitely give that to the bonding company. We'd appreciate it. Or an index. We're not that yeah. late. We'll match them up. But you're right. There are a lot of projects going on. And a lot of subcontractors, too, not just public record, are working for larger GCs that have their own subguard insurance policies and other things in force. And they want to see your financials. Right. Yeah, sure. I have nothing to hide. You want to see how consistently profitable I am on different size projects? There you go. You're not going to know which project it was, and you're not going to know how I made the money, but you're going to see that I got cash, equity, and I make money on my projects. So bring it. Bring yeah. it. Well, nobody's trying to hide anything, but there there was a reason we did that. That's right. There, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for explaining that. Is there anything else you want the listeners to know about key components of a financial statement? I think we hit the highlights. I mean, I, hopefully I answered the questions that you've got. Anything major that I didn't answer? No, you answered everything. And I do love a lot of the things that you do as extra value added service to your contractors and to us bonding companies. Because you talking, we use this expression, grease in the wheels. You grease the wheels, they move smoothly, they don't squeak, they go up and down the track. And a good financial statement greases the wheels. And also, might I add, please get together with your construction-oriented CPA before the year end is done and with your bond agent to discuss the elements that are going to be in place there. It just takes a little bit of time. Please do that for us, your bonding agent. We, we really appreciate it because the worst thing we can do as your agent is have surprises. And the last thing I'm going to say, and I've said this before, it always embarrasses Wade, but you don't learn construction accounting in college. You just don't. It comes from experience. And it is, there's so many moving elements. Like you were saying, you got a huge amount of materials being stored. What are you going to do when you ask the owner to prepay that? How are you going to account for that? So these are the sort of things. How do you post a job properly? How do you say, we got to recognize a loss on this? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, we do. And it's okay. Doing it right does not gut your program. It doesn't hurt your bond program. Doing it right helps your bond program. You know, everybody feels better every step of the way. The wheels are greased. Everybody's pulling with the same set of oars. I guess I could use those analogies all day and all night and I'll stop now, but I guess you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate you kicking that around. And I actually do agree with you that from my experience that disclosing that you got a loss on a job is not the end of the world. Surprising a bonding company with the loss that can wreck your bonding program. Yeah. Or take all the cash out of your company and then get right. your in and right. then ask for a bond. Okay, and thank you all for listening to the Contractor Success Forum, wherever you might be tuning in from. Find us on our YouTube channel at Carpenter CPAs, or for more information, be sure to check the show notes for more free resources. If you haven't already, we sincerely appreciate it if you'd consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and ring that notification bell to follow each episode as we post it every week. As we said before, our mission is to provide game-changing financial education for contractors to help you be more profitable, grow, and succeed in your business. And we sincerely appreciate your support and comments in this journey. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you.